and welcome everyone. Um, uh, my name is Sophie Thomas. I'm co-director of the design department here at the RSA and I'm delighted to welcome you all here for today's lunchtime talk. Um, before we give, begin, can I just ask you to make sure your mobiles are on switch to silent. Uh, we are filming today's event so, um, we, and we're live streaming so welcome to all those tuning in uh, by the web and a reminder that the hashtag is not up there, weirdly, but it's uh, hashtag RSA Lead Beater if you want to get involved in the discussion on Twitter. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's special guest speaker. Charles Ledbetter is a leading authority on innovation and creativity and an advisor to governments, cities, organisations throughout the world. He has a long distinguished track record of involvement in social innovation and is the author of best-selling books such as We Think, Mass Innovation, Not, Not Mass Production, as well as many influential reports such as The Rise of the Social Entrepreneur. He joins us today to share some of his thinking from his new book, The Frugal Innovator. Um, and in the book, Charles looks at a wave of innovations and innovators from Latin America, Asia and Africa who are responding to tight constraints of capital and resource by devising low-cost solutions to pressing social challenges which are lean, simple, clean and social. Now, frugal innovation is a concept, concept which chimes absolutely with the principles driving much of the RSA's current work in the design department. And, and looking at design and manufacture. Um, our flagship programme, The Great Recovery, addresses some of the major economic problems and environmental challenges caused by the dominance of this linear take-make-waste model of design, manufacture and consumption, which we're currently stuck in. We argue that there's a need to shift towards a more circular system where we get the materials back into the system. And through this is a uh, widespread application of good design thinking based on very local disruption and some of the same principles of simplicity and resourcefulness that Charles has been so powerfully advocating in his books. So it is with really great pleasure that, to welcome you to the stage today, Charles, and to learn more about the ideas in your new book. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Charles. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Sophie, for that introduction um, written by my mother. And uh, it's very good to see all of you here. I think it's always um, great to get to a place that you're speaking at early because then you can feel relaxed, but the cost is that then when you arrive there is no one here, which is slightly unnerving, so it's very nice to see all of you here uh, in a room that was empty when I arrived. Um, and I will, I'll just say a little bit about the ideas in this book. As I was saying to Sophie, one of the weird things about writing books is it all takes way too long. Uh, and then um, you've written the book and uh, roughly speaking I would say about six weeks after it's published you realise what the book was really about and what you should have written. So I'm not really going to talk about the book, I'm going to talk about what should be in the book or what is in the book but's not clear enough. Um, uh, and just to say um, this, I'm not the first person as ever to, to write about these things. Many uh, of the ideas that I'm talking about and some of the issues covered by um, C.K. Prahalad in his groundbreaking book, Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, and by a group of Cambridge academics in a great book called Jugad Innovation, which is about India. And so it builds on lots of ideas from lots of people, and it's an attempt to bring them together into, I suppose, a different story of innovation. So innovation, uh, if I ask you, I'm just going to ask you, you don't have to say anything, just... I'm going to say the word innovation, and you think of a company or a product. So, um, uh, you know, this is more like a cathedral than a shop. Um, it's a sort of place where we go to see sort of artifacts with special qualities that will sort of transport us into heaven. And it's all gleaming glass and kind of light and possibility and all the rest of it. And here is a kind of miracle worker. Um, because when he unveiled these things, which we all have in abundance, uh, you know, it's literally it was, you know, it took your breath away that you could just swipe like that and uh, things would appear. And I suppose Apple, Google, um, Silicon Valley in general, uh, that whole story has been the dominant story of innovation, I would say, since 
probably the late 80s, mid 90s certainly. Um, and it's one that people all over the world are trying to copy with silicon this and silicon that. And it's a story which is a bit like this, which is that innovation is essentially about competition. It's about competitive advantage. It's about using new technologies um, and the freedom to have new ideas. So you put people in environments where they're free from bureaucratic constraints and free from um, convention and you give them bean bags and endless supplies of caffeine. Um, and then with the right kind of facilitation, they brainstorm amazing ideas which are open up new markets which people haven't thought about before and you get blue ocean strategies and full of possibility and the rest of it. And this is the kind of dominant story, we want more of that. And so you hear politicians and others say, European Googles and why haven't we got a Facebook and so on and so forth and that's why everyone is so excited by Silicon Roundabout and Tech City and Shoreditch and so on and so forth. All of that I think is amazing, fantastic and brilliant but it's only one story and there might be a different story and the different story and why it might be relevant comes from a set of other factors that we should bear in mind and I'll just these are, I think, global in their application, although what they mean is different in different places. And the first is that we live in a world of tightening, if not severe, constraints. Um, so, uh, just anecdotally, I mean, I can't think of an organization that I go to to advise them or talk to say, oh, we've just got so much stuff, you know, so much money, resource, we don't know what to do with it. Actually, all of them say we've got to do more with less. Um, we, we face tightening constraints on resources, uh, particularly perhaps water, but also forms of energy, precious materials and others, actually getting the resources for the take, make and waste system that say, was talking about it's becoming harder and harder we're having to press further and further on those limits and at a more prosaic level if you look at the kind of people who are becoming consumers around the world they're in the developed world here um, most people on middle incomes are not going to see their incomes rise very much um, the driving force of innovation in the post-war era uh, in this economy, which was the aspirational middle class, are not going to be the beneficiaries of huge increases in real incomes. On the contrary, their incomes are going to be constrained. In the developing world, it's people earning 5 to $10 a day and perhaps eking out small bits that they can invest in uh, precious uh, goods and services that really count to them. So I think one of the big factors in the world is constraint, which means that people can, who can innovate in the face of constraint become really, really important. The second thing is rising aspirations. So what's the biggest kind of single trend worldwide, the most potent force of social and economic change? It is that roughly 70 million people a year are moving to cities so we're building the equivalent of six mega cities a year the world over what's pulling people to cities it's the possibility of better jobs better houses better education better outcomes um, and so all over the world people's aspirations are rising the, the developing world it might be aspirations to own a mobile phone own a television own a moped maybe have a a spare room at the back of your house, maybe have a flushing toilet, so on and so forth. In this world, it might be to have better quality, better standard of living, better balance of living in some kind of way. But there's no sense in which aspirations are dimming. So we face a world of, I think, tightening constraints and rising aspirations. And this is a world of kind of dissonance and conflict. How do you reconcile those two? Well, the third factor going in our favor is that we have apparently blessed with technology now limitless opportunities for collaboration. And those opportunities to collaborate in new ways, to create new models of organization, to share resources and to create things together in more imaginative ways is the greatest abundant resource that we have. And so the task of innovators, I think, is going to be about how you meet severe constraints to meet rising aspirations using these opportunities for collaboration. 
What's the rub of that? The rub is you can't do that without challenging the status quo because all those new collaborative models will in some sense challenge, disrupt or threaten established ways of doing things which are more hierarchical, less collaborative, more entrenched, so on and so forth. And so as a result, the world becomes more uncertain because small things can have big impacts, because new players can suddenly disrupt existing markets, so on and so forth. And so again, this means that innovation, the capacity to act in the face of uncertainty, becomes really, really critical. So in a way, making sense of what I've been, some of what I've been trying to do over the last five years, is I've been looking at people who, when faced with this combination of things, do not stick their heads in the ground and don't sort of embed themselves in the past, but come up with practical, really effective kinds of solutions. And I'll just introduce you to a little snapshot of some of the people I'm talking about. Um, so this is what they do. They, they meet constraints by creating these collaborative solutions, often by not inventing things, but by borrowing and reusing things. Um, and establish, challenging established models. And often in their stories, one of the things that's interesting is how humble they are. Um, they don't want to be heroic inventors. They want to be non-heroic borrowers. And secondly, how often at the outset of their journey, they were told by professionals and people who knew, you simply cannot do that. Or you simply cannot do that and you shouldn't do it because it's wrong. So um, let me introduce uh, a few of these people. This is literally the most creative, radical, revolutionary man that I've ever met. Um, and this picture was taken in his um, kitchen in Pune in India, then the fastest growing city in Asia. And his name is Madhav Chavan, and he's the founder of Pratam, uh, now arguably the largest and most influential educational NGO in India. And what Madhav did was take an idea that had emerged from the Mumbai, um, Mumbai University's School of Social Work to create low-cost preschool playgroups. And Madhav is not an educationalist. His background was in trade union organizing. And he brought to that challenge the sensibility of a trade union organizer. He thought the challenge here is to grow a movement. It's not to just provide a service. And I've got no resources. How do I do it? And so what he came up with was a way to create low-cost preschool, they're called Balwadis, by training very quickly in a kind of pretty rough and ready way uh, young women who graduated from school who themselves had limited opportunities to work, needed to work close to home for all sorts of reasons, but with this kind of training and a little bit of help could create a small micro-business out of their front room uh, by educating um, a handful, maybe 10, 15 children. The price point for Pratam, and I've grown to really respect people who have price points which are really low, the price point is $10 a year. So how do you educate a child for $10 a year? That's a really testing constraint. And you can only do that if you think in completely new ways. So what Madhav and his team did was um, develop a resource that was underutilized and crying out for opportunity, using piggybacking on existing facilities, using a lot of community input as well. Pratam has educated 21 million young people. It's 500,000 Balwadis all across India. It's so simple, it's spread like a kind of, like a virus. And when I met him literally in this, so this, this uh, discussion that I was having with him in his kitchen, I'd met him at like 10 o'clock at night. Uh, he was coming out of his last meeting of the day with his team. Uh, they'd been discussing how to improve the maths curriculum in these preschool balwadis. Um, we drove across town. At about half past midnight, his wife called and basically told him to get rid of me. And he said, yes, yes, yes. And then we carried on talking for another hour and a half. And he said, early on in their um, process, they had been introduced to, McDonald, uh, introduced to McKinsey. And McKinsey had done this pro bono work and said, what you need to do is turn this into McDonald's, have a franchise, a kit, the same everywhere. And Madhav said, well, why don't we do it like a Chinese restaurant? 
You, you never go into a Chinese restaurant and think, crikey, this is a Chinese restaurant. I never realized. In other words, Chinese restaurants are absolutely obvious wherever they go, but there are no big global brands. So it's a global phenomenon, but there are no big global brands. That's because they follow the same principles, but apply those principles in different ways in different settings. So one of the lessons of Pratam, which is really interesting, is that this is not just small, this is scale. And it's scale because they adopted a very different kind of model. Uh, this is a second thing that comes from India, um, created by a guy called Ganesh Panadi, um, who was an electricity engineer in Kentucky, went back to India, spent about a year, I think, trying to think um, his way through how to create electricity that was affordable and clean, for rural villages in the rice growing belt of India, thought a lot about solar power um, and played with various things, none of them worked. And then after about a year came up with going back to an old technology, biomass gasification. This is a kind of technology that was used here in World War II when we didn't have enough petrol and oil. So this is not new, this is old and it's just reinvented. But what he did was create a way to do this at sufficient scale so that whole villages could sign up to it. So this is husk power systems, and this is classic frugal innovation in a way. It's an old technology reused and updated. Um, it's a social solution because all of the village has to sign up to make it kind of a business model, but people can sign up very simply to very simple models. So, if two houses want to share one light bulb in the alley between them so they can do things at night like homework and what have you, they can do that. You can go up to powering a fridge and a fan. But this is really basic because when the lights go out in these villages, everything stops. You can't do homework, you can't work, you can't shop, you can't see the doctor, so on and so forth. It's incredibly basic. The raw material is discarded rice husks which were, had no apparent value. Uh, and finally, these two guys, these, these are my favorite social entrepreneurs in the world, probably, because they don't look like social entrepreneurs, they look like wide boys. And they are wide boys. Um, and they're very kind of entertaining and engaging wide boys. And they came out of, um, again, one of the lessons of these people is that they often come not straight on, but they come slightly left field or they come slightly sideways at an issue. They started some of the first and rather probably unsavory um, 0800 telephone numbers in Mexico. And they were casting around for other things that people would pay to listen to or down a telephone. And they thought, what about a doctor? So they literally, they employed a doctor to sit on the end of a telephone thinking that people would call for doctorly advice. They had about three goes at it. They were on the verge of failing when the sort of mobile revolution took off. And then they worked out how to do it with basically applying a sort of call center technology to uh, medical advice. This is without any knowledge of NHS Direct or anything like that. And they created this thing in this call center on the edge of, on the edge of Mexico City, which is basically a low cost primary healthcare system. So primary healthcare, in Mexico, as in much of the world, very difficult to access. Um, to wait in the queue means taking a day off work, so you, you um, lose earnings. Then you have to wait for a long time. If you're lucky enough to get a prescription, that's another day to get the prescription, which will cost a lot. This costs $5 a month, added to your phone bill. You get 24-7 medical advice, but more importantly, they've organized their callers into a kind of buying community, collaborative consumption. So you get sort of discounts of anything between 30 and 60%. And so medical home is basically, if you find it hard to create a primary healthcare system, actually piggybacking on, med on mobile networks and using them in the right way could give you that.